I am originally from Montgomery, Alabama in the States and USA. Been musically inclined and playing piano since I was four. Um, joined my dad's band uh, really young. Um, so I learned how to see how a band interacts with each other. Then naturally just got into music production. I was definitely a big hip hop fan. So did a lot of that type of stuff when I was uh, in high school. Then I uh, went to school at University of Alabama, Birmingham in um, Alabama. Studied music technology. Wasn't really a music tech major. It was more like a music performance thing um, with a couple computer ensemble classes to say it was technical. I hate to uh, down UAB, but it's just the truth. And then uh, interned at a studio called Atmosphere Recording in Montgomery. And that's where I started to really learn how the studio works, how to interact with clients. Um, and then um, just develop my own type of style of production and mixing. Got a placement in 2007 on uh, TI versus TIP. Um, it was Watch What You Say To Me with Jay-Z on it. And then later on, went to open up my own studio called Mixology Recording Studios in 2009. And then uh, met a young, promising talent called Doe who was tragically gunned down a few year, a couple years after I worked with him. But he started to work with um, T.I., um, Hustle Gang, Grand Hustle, um, and uh, was on his way. But it's like he, got, he tragically got gunned down here in uh, our hometown. And uh, then, you know, been working with my studio up until 2018, then transitioned online and moved overseas. And I changed my studio to Mixology Studios Online and then have been mixing and mastering ever since with some production. Fantastic. It's so good to hear everything and, you know, talk about your process as well. And, uh, you know, and that's actually why I wanted to get you onto this podcast, because with the whole COVID thing that's happened and everything kind of moving online, it's, you know, this episode is about kind of how to attract and how to find clients and how to deal with clients. Um, and we actually met via Engineer Is, which is uh, Mixed by Ali's mixing thing. And, you know, I wanted to chat to you about kind of your process um, for finding clients and uh, how you deal with clients kind of going from a studio setting to, you know, mainly doing an online business for mixing and mastering and kind of what's like your process for that and you know what have you learned along the way um my process is just really building relationships and that could be that could mean a various number of things um it could be where somebody's inquiring obviously and sometimes they just simply ask how much you charge and i'll simply tell them that so um i try to keep it at that first and then if they're interested in that um, then we'll keep going. But actually, before that, all that happens, uh, I utilize, utilize social media as much as possible. Now, I'm not on it like hugely or a lot. Um, I usually post a lot of stories and I'm just myself. You know, um, sometimes I like to joke. Sometimes um, I'm very serious. Sometimes I show the technical side, but I try to show, you know, much as much as I want to show. I don't show much of my personal life, but I try to show what's related to what I do, um, what I like. Um, sometimes I can be opinionated. And so when people see that, I feel like, um, you know, you, you're, bu you're building a profile for the potential client. And when you do that, <clears throat> it kind of, in, in, in those different type of areas, it yeah. shows who you are, what you like, and that might attract the person that uh, will want to do business with you in the future. So uh, that that tends to work out really well for me. Um, I think what I you just to... said there is, is so important. Like you said, like be yeah. yourself, I think is key because if you try and, you know, try and find clients um, and you're not being yourself, it's going to be the wrong kind of client. So it could be the wrong kind of music that you want to work on if you're not being true to, to who you are. So I think for any of the listeners listening to this, it's when you are going to promote, be true to who you are um, on, the, on the promotion side as well. And like you mentioned about the social media, it's a game changer, isn't it now <laughs> with everything that's happened yeah. is everything yeah. is just social media and, and, um, yeah. So, uh, it's, it's interesting to kind right. of hear your, your kind of process on that. And do you find that the quality of the mixes you get from since, you know, since going online has the quality kind of gone up, gone down, you know, because everything's kind of been a bit more remote. 
uh, in most recent times that than before. Have you do you, do you feel that's changed at all in anything? Yeah, um, obviously, you know, I get a lot more clients that either record themselves uh, as opposed to going to a studio to record. And um, even then, if they go to the studio to record, you know, clients really don't know um, what to look for in an engineer. So uh, it, it, it's up and down, but, you know, the source material, I think, has gone down a little bit. So it's just me having to really focus in on, you know, uh, cleaning up a lot of the source material. Um, so uh, made our then, job harder. You know, <laughs> right. So it's just, you know, if if I'm not hearing any issues and, you know, recording is pretty simple, I think, uh, for artists to be able to do themselves. But if I'm hearing an issue, I'll let them know prior to starting. And then um, they respect uh, as well. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's just, you know, you know, and that's the part of the education, the, the relationship thing. When you're starting to build with somebody that you're working with and that there's an issue then I tell them and then help them along as far as the recording process is concerned. Cause there was a client I was talking to uh, this morning and uh, the, the source material um, wasn't that great. It looked like it was clipping. It looked like um, sounded distorted or it looked like it was, they were using a limiter compressor, like very hard on their vocals. And I asked them, you know, are you using limiter compressor or whatever? And they said, not at all. So that led me to believe that, well, then they're recording too hot. So I'm there. I'm then from there. I'm trying to educate the client or I don't even like saying client. I just educate the artist um, on what they could do better, how to get better source material with recording. And then they appreciate that type of thing. When they appreciate the type of thing, then you, I, I try to do my best. And then usually they love it and they keep coming back. So that's another customer retention type of uh uh, I wouldn't say technique, but strategy or whatever you call it to get clients and retain them. You know, I think it's it's going above and beyond, isn't it? Every everything you do, you know, you're not just with a client taking the money, doing the job to the bare minimum, getting paid and kind of running off. It's you're coaching them through the whole artist thing. You're helping them develop themselves because, you know, as a mix myself, I've noticed since the whole kind of COVID thing and everyone's been kind of recording at home, there does seem to be more kind of technical issues arising um and often i feel like it's because the artist doesn't understand the mixing process of what we do and so if something's distorting they may think oh it can get sorted out and actually if something is distorting there is no nothing we can do i mean maybe rx <laughs> but even then right. it's never going to save it to, to what it can be so it's it's great to you know like you said have that relationship with the people that you're working with and as you say, it comes as like a domino effect and people just keep coming and returning. So, um, you know, right. it's, it's really good to know that. I mean, do you do you have like a, a way of doing social media? I know you mentioned earlier on that you don't share everything and that you share, um, you know, work related stuff. Do you have um, like a schedule for that in like your workflow? So if you're starting out, is that something you prioritize? I mean, I know obviously you've been doing this for a long time now, but is social media something you prioritize in your job, you know, quite, quite a lot? Um, I try not to, um, yeah. cause you know, social media can suck you in and you know, the scrolling can be very addictive and yeah. I'm yeah. definitely guilty of that. So, um, lately I've been doing a lot of other different projects, um, outside of, um, mixing and mastering. I have some real estate stuff I'm doing right now. So I've been very busy with that. I don't show any of that, you know what I'm saying, on uh, social media because I don't think that's relevant for one. And then that's really private for two. And then three, um, I'll show it when I can. I don't really have a schedule um, because with mixing and mastering, as you know, doing online, you can kind of work when you want. And um, sometimes that might be early morning. Sometimes it might be afternoon. Sometimes it might be super late at night. Yeah. Um, but the key of it is, is that, when whenever i am that's when i post and i you know, to be honest i don't post like i should to be honest um i think but, it's so easy because we're both you know you're trying to do the job at the same time aren't you and it's like if you're posting on social media you're not mixing at the same time of of, of posting so obviously you're, you're super busy so it's kind of getting that kind of you know middle ground i guess of how much you're trying to get clients by posting and actually how much of the work that you're doing 
you know, right. and that's why it's so interesting to talk about this kind of stuff because, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast, they're they're either a mixing engineer or they're starting out in mixing or they want to attract more clients or, and get more clients. And, you know, like you said, social media, you can get sucked into it so much that actually you become doing social media <laughs> kind of only before the actual job. And it's kind of, you know, like I said, it's like, you know, finding that middle ground. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's good to hear kind of your view on it. Um, Right. And, you know, um, I I don't try like it's impossible to show everything that I do, Um, but I try to show stuff that's a little more interesting than normal. Like, you know, you can go online, YouTube, wherever and, you know, learn about EQ and compression, blah, blah, this and that. But my take on it is if I use social media, I'm coming from my point of view um, instead of the overall suggested point of view that most people just talk about like you know they show different type of techniques and stuff and that's cool and all and that's very that's that's great but at the same time like i'll go on social media and comment on something like that and just make a general blanket statement i'll just say something like um you know people show you these different types of techniques on youtube blah blah blah, this and that and all while that's good at the end of the day it really depends on your listening environment your acoustic treatment um, and if you're not hearing correctly, then uh, you need to correct that first before you try to buy like ten thousand dollars worth of speakers. Because if you buy ten thousand dollars worth of speakers and you have no acoustic treatment, then it sounds like zero dollars worth of exp- speakers. You get what I'm saying? That's so amazing. I just what come you just from said. like a yeah. <laughs> so I try to I try to cons- make that concise yeah. on social yeah. media, easily digestible, and you know I could spend time to make a reel. I, I I don't make I don't have the time like like I ha- like I would like to right now to make reels like that. But, you know, I'll probably keep a mental note, write that down and then make a reel for that later. And so, like I said, that's another method of me talking and being myself and then also giving game to a potential client or artist that wants to work with me. And then it builds trust. And then also. um um, builds a profile on me to feel, for for the client to feel like, oh, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. I'm going to go check him out. Then they'll go check my mixes because I'll repost stuff from artists that I work with on social media. That's another technique and, and strategy. So if it sounds great, then uh, they'll hit me up and they'll either book straight away or they'll just, uh, they'll just uh, reach out like, how much do you charge? And then it goes from there. So sometimes like it works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, most times it does, though, It's because like, you know, you can do that whole fish, you know, rod, throw it out and be like, um, hey, I got this discount for mixing and mastering. But that's not really I don't think that's effective. You know, um, I, I think hate people want to see what you offer and come to you because of your previous stuff and i think you know that's another you know major point it's you know your last mix it's like you know you've got to be 100 percent happy with everything you do and you know really give that 110 percent because you don't know who's going to be listening to your previous mix and and what work that can lead into and you know when a lot of people ask me and i'm sure it's the same for yourself it's oh you know how do you get the mixing work because you know when, when you're starting out you know you get all these people going oh you know i'm really good at mixing or i've been practicing a lot um but i don't seem to have anybody that comes to me and i've I've worked out that no, no one is going to come to you unless you kind of put out stuff that is going to attract them to come to you. If that, you know, exactly. So it's a law it's, of attraction type of thing. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, you know, it's so interesting chatting to you because, you know, you say your points and you, you know, people will come to you for the sound that you're putting out, you know, and you know exactly what you're, what you're putting out. So it, it's interesting to, uh, to hear all that. And uh, especially about going on to the speaker thing. I think with social media, it's so easy to look at other people, the big studios, isn't it? Or, you know, I need to have those Amphia monitors or I need those, you know, whatever monitors. And it's, you know, it's all about what's going to work for you and your workflow and and obviously the room that you're in. And and that's why everybody's different and everyone approaches, uh, you know, mixing different. Um, So do you have you know when you find you know when you have all your clients and stuff how do, you know do you do you kind of are you quite like monday to friday only in general or you know kind of especially in mixing world we have 
obviously working hours seems to kind of be out the window. Is that the same for you or, you know, what's your view on yeah. <laughs> it? Yeah, it varies. Like Everyone's it's the same. not a set schedule. It's not a set schedule. As busy as I am, you know, especially right now in the States because I haven't been back in a couple of years. So I'm having a lot, having a lot of business sometimes, mostly through, through the day. Yeah. And then um, I'll tackle my stuff at night or I'll get to it as soon as I wake up and work on a mix and um then come back to it later or finish it off in the in the morning it really depends yeah it's just it's never set ever so um it's been so i, I kind of like it that way because for one it forces i'm i'm ar- i'm already forced to take an ear break um so when i'm that busy come back to it then you hear it with fresh ears and then you can nail out a a, a knock out a mix and nail it um, as opposed to in one setting, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, but I'm very quick to do it in one setting too. So, either way, you know, either way it goes, just whatever it's gonna take, take the job, uh, get the job done. You know, sometimes I might, you know, when I take those force breaks and you know I'm riding in the car, uh, I can check it in the car as well. Do the car test, the beloved car test, of course. Um, and uh, you know, it it works out, man. Like definitely works out. And most times I knock it out. And in this new room, I'm having it a little, just a little bit, but um, for the most part, it's been accurate. So that's what I like to do. Fantastic. So do you, um, so, you, you know, when, when you've got all your clients, you know, how do you have like a, a way of kind of, um, you know, a, a lot of people ask me, you know, people listening, they want to know kind of the kind of understanding what the client wants. Do you have like a... Um, a brief for, or like a chat with them before you kind of take on a mix? Um, kind of what's kind of your process on, on that? Um, right. Um, so I just try to get a sense of the client. Sometimes it could be very simple. It could be like, just check the files. Everything looks good. Is there anything specific you want done to the song? And then I leave it open to them and they either say, just do you, or they'll be a little more detailed. But the red flag for me is if uh, I ask that and they give me notes of, pay, pay, or, or, or pages of notes. Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I know exactly you know, what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so if I see that, then I'll be like, you know what? We might not be able to work together because um, that doesn't really give me free reign to do things. And I like to be creative during a mix. Um, sometimes, you know, it's not time to do to, to be, be creative and you got to really judge that once I get the files to assess, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I always like to get the files first and then assess and then say that. Um, and then if it's something I can't work on then I just, you know, I'll just tell them I can't do it, uh, because of this and that, because it's distorted, blah, 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 this and that. So, uh, that's my process. And, um, it usually works out pretty well. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I try, try not to get too deep into it but just enough to where i can get what what they're looking for and then sometimes i'll go and look on their profile or look at what they've done or listen to what they've done and uh check out and see what they have been getting and what could i do to improve on it so um that's a great way i don't do that yeah i don't do that often though yeah i don't do that often it's usually like I, when I hear it, because I've been doing this for so long, when I hear it, I know exactly what needs to be done. It's just that I check with them and make sure that we're on the same page. So when I do it, I like to get it knocked out on one pass. You know what I'm saying? Like V1. And I say like V1 gang on my social media sometimes. It's be funny. <laughs> but uh, and not, sometimes I might not get it on V1. Sometimes I might, it might be V2, V3, it might sometimes be V4, V7, you know. Yeah, but most times I try to knock it out on the first pass. We make I establish that we're on we're on the same page co- communicatively, and then if that's a word, and then um, uh, <laughs> and then uh, try to knock it out, you know, and um, try to just when I and then also when I mix, it's just a matter of uh, not really thinking, just knowing what I need to do, doing it, trying to do it instinctively, and then um take that break, do what I got to do, car test, come back. And that's why I'll say like, uh, once they pay, I have them pay first. 
and I, you know, I, I return it back in two days, maybe less. And usually, this is this is another technique. This is another gem right here. Always uh, under promise and over deliver. So what that means is that I say I'll get it done in two days. I actually get it done in like an hour or maybe four total time and uh, sit on it. And sometimes if I know it's it's a good mix, I'll just, I'll really wait till the next day and then send it. And then I for, for one, I deliver it uh, ahead of time, a full days ahead. Um, and then they love it and then they feel like, oh, you're very prompt. And then uh, they come back. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's one of my strategies. Do you know, I, I'm going to take that on board because I uh, I have this thing as, you know, where I will, you know, where I will say, you know, you get really busy as, you know, as, as, as you do. And then you go, oh, I'll do that next week. And then it's like, oh, I've got 20 other mixes to do. <laughs> that just isn't going to happen. And it's trying to like manage it, I guess. So, you know, it's it's a really good, you know, strategy that you're saying there because it's you're giving yourself the time, yet you're going to deliver more than they expected. And again, it goes back to returning clients again and, you know, a good a good, you know, relationship between yourself and the client. And I think that is super important to have. I think in any kind of job or anything, especially when it comes down to the creative world of mixing and getting your vision and getting the client's vision and understanding each other and to create something that that you can use your knowledge with um, that they may not have. Um, because, you know, it's... I, and I think understanding and communicating with the client is super important. I mean, so how, how do you deal then? Um, I mean, you don't... I have to go into too much detail, but how do you deal with a really tricky client in the sense of that you've, you, they, you've had that conversation with them. Um, you've, you've done the best you can do. What kind of things do you do to kind of maintain, I guess, um, the most professional relationship you can, but you know, if we've all had it where they want you to do something and you're just like, you, it's, you don't want to do that kind of thing. How how do you kind of process that situation? Right. It's I don't deal with that too often, but it has happened. Yeah. Um. So let me see if I try to can try to remember. Um. So first a big off, question. If it gets very, <laughs> yeah. So first off, if it gets very difficult, you know, all all that type of stuff in the back of my mind is like we are never working again. <laughs> for one, <laughs> love that. You know, <laughs> Right. So and then two, you know, I do my best to appease it. But like I offer like up to three revisions so it can go up to V4. And, you know, if I don't get it knocked out on by that time, then then it's not me. It's them. You know what I'm saying? But like if they so say like like this, just listen to the files. Everything looks good. Is there anything you want to do specifically to the song? They say, do you? Um, you can try this and that. They keep it real simple, but do you, I trust with your judgment. I like, cool. I do me. And then they don't like it. Right. And they'd be like, well, I wanted to do this and do that, do this and that. And then I'll be, I'll go back and say, well, I left the door open saying that, you know, anything specific. So if, if, if you need to tell me, please tell me up front. But now that you're telling me this, now I have a better understanding. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to do everything that you want me to do and then up to V4. And if there's something problematic after V4, that's not on me anymore. That's you. And so if you want to correct it, then you have to pay for those extra revisions. You get what I'm saying? Um, so that's how I handle it. And uh, it's either they do or they don't. Um, and then um, but I, I, I don't deal with it often, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, it, the times it's that I have. Your communication is is good to start with and that's one you know if everybody listening on this podcast if you know if you are yeah. dealing with clients which you will be as a mixer the communication at the start is so important because you're going to save important. yourself <laughs> a, a lot later of, down the yeah. line um do you find as yeah, well yep sorry yeah i just want to say it's a uh, it's a quote i think it said uh 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 an ounce of um an ounce of prevention it, uh, it weighs more than a pound of a uh, pound of a cure or something like that. <laughs> it's a quote like that. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it's so true. I mean, so do you, 
do you do you find then that you know when when you're dealing with a client you've got the files um and and you're mixing um when you are running into issues i mean one that does come up that i find a lot is vocal tuning um i you know, not not a lot a lot but it can happen where you get sent files to mix and you mix it and two things happen you're either me as the mixer i'm a bit like mm, something doesn't sound right but i'm not the producer so i don't want to change the pitch correction because is that what they meant and then you do the mix and then suddenly there's revisions but none of it's really to do with the mix it's to do with the the pitch correction or or arrangement um you know do you find you get much of that and if you do how do you deal with that i mean are you doing the pitch correction when you you get sent the files or is that kind of completely out of your hands? I mean, obviously it will change depending on song, but if we just talk right. in general, um, yeah. Well, it just depends. It de definitely depends. So, okay. So I'll illustrate an il uh, example of an artist that I did work with. Well, it wasn't the artist. It was like the manager or something. And uh, when I first mixed his record, um, before I even did it, I uh, definitely thought the pitch was way off, you know, and then the timing was way off. But in the hip hop and rap and certain sub genres of it, it's, it's, it's acceptable for the pitch to not be totally perfect, the auto tuning and the timing to be like kind of ahead of the beat, which is really weird to me. But that's a style. You got to respect it. Um, I said I said this at first. I said, look, it's definitely something. Uh, going on with the timing of the dudes rapping and there's something going on with the pitch. So I fixed it and they loved it. Right. So they come back to me on a second record. I do the same exact thing. And then they hated it. And I was like, well, you know, well, they were like, you know, leave it how it is. You know, don't change the auto tune, blah, 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 this, that and leave the time as it is. I say, well, I did this on the first record. You didn't say anything then. And then on the second record, you're saying it now. So you got to let me know, you know, and then I'll let you know before I did it. So um, another uh, one way to kind of prevent it is uh, I'll mix it completely sonically. Everything's good. Leave the auto tune how it is. Leave the timing as it is. And then do my drops, chops, all type of stuff. And then I'll make a second version inside the same session. I'll just duplicate it and it'll be further in in down the session and then i'll do what i feel like needs to be done and then i send them both versions so i'll be like well this is the original and then this is what i feel like that should be done you can pick between the two and it doesn't matter to me how which one you do but in my opinion the one that i fixed sounds better yeah that helps a lot you know and so it also helps like with having not having to go back and then, you know, moving stuff back where it needs to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so uh It must be really know, annoying uh, if they come back and go, Well, I like a little bit of that one, a little bit of that one. <laughs> yeah. That that can be a that can be a thing. Too. A can of well, I haven't got much of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could that could be that that's happened before. That's happened before. Yeah. But um um actually that happened yesterday. So uh <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it, 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 that auto tune Melodyne stuff. I don't actually use Melodyne, so don't kill me. But um, you know, the the tuning can be very tricky. But I find that most times they like it how it is. Yeah. Um, but if I hear it and there's like a huge issue, I gotta say something. You know what I'm saying? There's so one more one more example. Um, I work with a guy during the, actually the this last mixed competition. But he paid full price on the or full rate on the site. Um, he didn't wasn't aware of the competition. I worked with it, and he said, "I like my vocals how they are. I don't like any tuning at all, and I wanted to leave it just like this." And basically, they wanted it rough, right? And and the tune, the singing was off pitch, man, like horrible. So I went it. I did those two versions, like you know. And he liked the one that was not tuned. So, like, you know, the demoitis thing is a very big thing, too. You know, you got to have or be able to find clients that are able to uh, get over that demoitis thing. You know what I'm saying? Do you find so though, it can be very tricky? Do you yeah. find though when you get a song into mix that you notice problems, but the client doesn't really see that as a problem? Do you find your approach to mixing that is a bit like, 
oh, now it turns into a job. Do you know what I mean? You know, obviously, as mixers, we kind of enjoy mixing or we, you know, we enjoy the process. It must be so hard if you're mixing something that you, you're not happy with to begin with. I mean, do, do you find then you kind of kind of switch off from the mix or do you still feel like you always give that 110% no matter what, um, you know, what you're kind of coming into, if that makes sense? No, I still, uh, full effort, 150%, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm still going to share it, good or bad. You know, I don't share the bad stuff too much, but I will <laughs> share it at least once, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and you don't know who is listening you know, to that client that, you know, is it? Right. I mean, you probably get the same as well. It's always when you work on a track that you think is really good, it, it never does well. And then the track that kind of just came in randomly that you were like, yeah, well, this is all right. <laughs> Suddenly does great. Right. <laughs> it can be weird like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, it's just a matter of, you know, like feeling the, the artist out, you know, and then just trying to be on the same page, really, really trying to be on the same page. And uh, that can be a, a, a an art. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. I know uh, a lot of people also wonder um, kind of the the business side of dealing. Um, I mean, I know you mentioned a second ago that you take kind of full payment up front uh, before you, you do a mix. Um, do you find that that's the best way? Because I know some people will be like, no, I want to hear a, a demo mix first and all of this kind of stuff I've had before. And kind of what are your kind of how do you feel about that kind of stuff and and you know from doing it for a long time do you find taking the full payment up front makes the whole workflow with the client and yourself much easier to, from start or you know um well i'll i'll say this um if if you're an engineer just starting then i feel like you need to do a lot of a lot of free work for one and then two um you can't really demand upfront payment like that because you don't have any work to show for it. So as you're doing stuff, you know, as you're building your catalog of what you've done, stuff like that, then I would say create a playlist and then just add on to it as you finish mixes, stuff like that. Could be on Spotify, could be on YouTube. I find that YouTube is a little easier. Um, But, you know, on Spotify title, they can see credits, but sometimes people don't always credit you. You know what I'm saying? So... But um, I, I like to use a YouTube playlist. I actually put it on my page, record a mix mastered or produced by me. And then when it gets to that point, then, you know, as you're building clientele and you're intermediate engineer, then you can either start taking half payment up front and then half when you finish. And me personally, I don't like that, but I'll tell you why in a minute. So you got to kind of do that for a minute and then build up to a point where you can uh, you can you can ask for full payment up front, but that's only after you built a great reputation of doing great business and um, great turnaround. You have reviews on your, you know, with a Facebook um, uh, business page, which I have plenty of five-star reviews. And then also on engineers where it's plenty of five-star reviews. So you build a track record of doing great business, great sound, then you can charge upfront payment in full and they have no doubts that, you know, um, you can, you can, you're going to do a good job and you're not going to run off with money. So, uh, that's, that's what I would say about that. You know, do you, um, do you always make sure you get uh, credited at the end, um, for, for mixing? Is that kind of in your process? Are you like, okay, I'll mix it, but I want crediting for the mix because in the mixing world, as we both know, crediting mixing engineers, <laughs> Seems to kind of go out the window a lot. I mean, it's getting better, um, but right. uh, that is one one area that's uh, not quite there yet. I don't think is it. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite there. Um, the main main thing is like if you're gonna share it on social media, then tag me in it. Yeah, you know what I'm and then I'll share it. And then if they feel if they feel once you share it, they feel like, oh, okay, then you know, he's uh, he's sharing my stuff. He did a great job, you know, and you know, that's a way of crediting him. And that helps me get other clients. You get what I'm saying? That's like another strategy, like I said before. So, uh, it's all, it's all like a cycle. Yeah, it all kind of comes back, put stuff out, get more work in that, so, you know, for anybody yeah. listening, so, it really is about the content that you put out is going to be what you, what you get back. Do you find as well? I mean, I know some of the people listening here are, you know, are producers as well. And, 
or their producers and mixers um but you know maybe they want to go more into mixing but they find that they're getting work via production to mix um because you know a lot of producers are kind of doing the rough mix or they are getting the mix um do you find in the work that you get um uh, you know especially when you were first starting out or you know even up to now when you are getting jobs through to mix do you find that you're having to add production or do any production to make it to a standard where you feel like okay this is top standard now um or or not Right. Um. Sometimes, very rarely, I add production because I feel like that's a separate thing. Yeah. Yeah. And a separate charge, separate fee. You get what I'm saying? So, of course. But sometimes, you know, I might just do it uh, in the mix. And sometimes I might not even tell them. Yeah. That's kind of a bad thing. Just replace but the kicks and went, snares. <laughs> yeah. I replace the kicks a lot. Like, I don't tell, I never tell them, uh, you know, ever do that. But it's, it's an easy fix. Yeah. I use Trigger 2 from Slate. I have a great drum selection of kicks. Pick one that sounds better sonically with whatever's going on and then replace it. And then they love it. They actually don't ever notice it um, or never say anything about it because the, the, it's knocking. But, um, yeah, I just sometimes just do it. Sometimes I have to replace the 808, too. So, you know, I'll get the 808 track by itself, throw it in Ableton, listen to it, and then redo it in the better key. Yeah. Um, or better 808 sound and throw back in and sometimes that's noticeable and they'll say something about that but sometimes i'll be like yo i needed to replace this because this 808 was way out of tune and if i put it in this key it's going to knock way harder so let me know what you think if you don't like it i'll put the old one back nine times out of ten they like the new one going above and so, beyond yeah yeah so yeah above and beyond you know yeah, yeah. um sometimes you got to do that sometimes you got to do it sometimes you know i just don't touch it I just work with what I got. And sometimes, you know, it just depends, you know, on the situation, what calls for, it. you know, it's not a, ever a, a cut and dry rule. Yeah. It's interesting what you say, because sound selection is like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whenever Super. I get a new client and, you know, and, you know, as we all had, we, you know, you have that communication at the start and you hear the rough, like the mix is is going to make it that bit better but if, if it's the wrong kick drum sound or the wrong snare it doesn't matter who you are what, what plugins you have it's always going to sound rubbish <laughs> it's, yeah. it's always about the source that you that you get and i find actually in my work my world of mixing as well it's i feel like sometimes that it, it, you have to have this kind of it doesn't very rarely this happens but you know you'll have a client that may not be happy with the mix and actually it's not the mix that's the issue it's the source that they've provided you is the issue which is why you know and that's not i mean i'm not blaming any mixing or anything for the reason for that but there is something to be said as i'm sure you you've had this before where well you have because you've had to replace a kick drum you've just gone ahead and ahead and done it but it's it's kind of getting that kind of fine line with your uh, clients and having that communication understanding to get it to to a top level there's certain things that need to be done um, right. You know, and see that falls in a line of production too. But, you know, I went, see, I, I used to do, you know, stuff like that all the time. And then I started to pull back from it because I was like, well, I feel like, you know, this is production. So I should be credited as a producer as well. So I went with the, to mix with the masters with Jason Joshua and Dave Pensado. And they talked about that type of thing. And, uh, they said they do that shit all the time. Like, um, they, sorry, I cussed, but, uh, Dave uh, said, "Yeah, I, I I do that all the time." And he like he would blatantly do it, you know. Um, and uh, sometimes he would get in trouble for it. Sometimes he wouldn't. Um, but their their motto was like, "Do whatever you need to do to make it the best record possible." And so that really hit me. Like, well, okay, I need to go back to doing that. Um, so that's why I like to label myself like a producer slash engineer because I approach a mix from a producer standpoint yeah and then engineer it sonically you know what i'm saying so yeah and at the end of the day if you're going to get a better mix then <laughs> right it's a better mix you can't argue with it can you so uh yeah. you know i think it's, it's super super important and how do you um i guess go about kind of so once you've delivered the mix you say they get kind of up to four revisions is that is that what you said they get yeah uh three and then it goes to v4 so v1 is that and then three revisions will be up to v4 yeah yeah and and do you i mean 
talking about that, how do you kind of like to receive kind of mixed revision notes in your workflow? Do you have like a, a specific kind of platform? Uh, like there's file pass on engineer ears, there's the way they do it. Um, you know, for anybody starting out kind of, if they get to a situation where an artist wants changes, but doesn't really understand the changes that they want, they're just not sure on something. Is there a way that you approach that? For example, let's say the artist is just hearing something um, and it could be like a panning, uh, but they don't know what that terminology of panning is. So they try and describe it in a way and it's just kind of not quite getting the point across. Do you, you know, I guess for experience, you can kind of understand your client, but do you have a, a process for anybody that's doing this, that's new to it or has been doing it for a while, but is running into issues like this still? Do you have like a way of kind of, extracting that yeah. information from the client yeah so i mean just i just you have to be telepathic for one <laughs> as an engineer you have to really know what they're talking about before they even say it um and sense it so that's kind of weird but to say but it's very true you know but uh it just depends on what's best communication for them right sometimes they might type everything out which I hate kind of to read it, but it's actually really too. good. <laughs> yeah. It's it's good that they do that. You yeah, know, yeah. To be very specific. Sometimes they can be like too specific. Yeah, yeah. But um it, it but if they are, then you know, that's a good that's that's sometimes it's a good thing and I and I don't have a problem because it'll be like a lot of little small stuff. Yeah. But if it's like a list of huge things, then put that thing back in my mind. We're never working again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love uh, that. <laughs> but uh and then and then just do my job and finish it off. So um they might either type it out, they might text it to me um via phone. I try not to get text. Um, or they might uh text me through IG. Um they might leave me voice notes. I hate that on IG. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's time consuming. You have to sit there, listen to it. But also, sometimes they don't do it in order. They'll do like a voice note and they'll do 10 different voice notes and you don't know which yeah. voice note is for which revision. So you have to listen from the start. Yeah. I had that the other day and I was like... Yeah, <laughs> jeez. So yeah, I mean, it just depends, you know. So it, it's a number of ways, but I try to have them try to commute, communicate to me in the best form that's best for them. And then you got to turn the sidekick telepathic powers on to figure out what they want and it's usually pretty easy for me to figure out but like i said having that conversation that little bit of simple communication before i start just like an ounce of ounce of cure or, or, or whatever you call it man an ounce of uh <laughs> prevention prevents a pound yeah yeah of uh cure or whatever that's what it Fantastic. is i think that's what that what it is I have yeah. a, a last question for you. And this is one thing that I always ask everybody at the end of the podcast. And I always say, what three things do you know now that you wish you knew when you first started out? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> I'll put you right on the spot. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. Um, acoustic treatment. You know, getting the room right. Number one. I think that should be implemented first before anything um because your environment is going to help you understand what you need to do and hear and fix or not fix um or, and feel um so that's one two is like um you know this is uh this is uh, man that's a pretty good question <laughs> two is um Dang, this is kind of hard. <laughs> Sorry. I wish what I, I know now, then I wish I knew then. Um, keeping it, okay, keeping it simple, but still have a technical sound mind of how to approach it. Yeah. So yeah. don't don't overthink. Don't try to overdo, because I see a lot of sessions where like they just throw a gang of plugins on a vocal chain or whatever. And then once you strip it away, it sounds better than what you did, you know? So just fix what needs to be fixed. But then again, it goes to the first one. You got to hear correctly in your environment to be able to do that. So that's why I say 
Don't overdo it. Don't overthink. You know, keep it simple, but have a tech, tech, technical sound mind about it. And then three, you have to really just feel stuff out. Don't be too technical. I guess that's number two, too. But uh, just, just how does it feel? How does the record feel to you? What does it make you feel like? What do what does the artist want to feel from it? When you get that down, then it makes the mix a lot easier because you know, you can approach and then you got to really approach things genre wise, what's called for for it. You know, if it's an R&B record, then, yeah, you got to make it smooth, silky, sexy, um, depending on the vibe of the record. Yeah. So, some R&B records are like trap records. But, you know, f for uh, reference, like R&B records, then you might have to do some, you know, um Definitely some tuning, some deplosive stuff, de click, you know, de clip. I'm looking at my stream deck. Um, just some corrective things to make it sound smooth, you know, throw a satin plug in to make it, you know, to tape sound on the vocal, to saturate a little bit, whatever. Um, and then with rap records, you might have to leave it as it is. It might be messed up vocals, like just peaking, you know. You, I, I definitely would correct the peaks, but, you know, it might be plosives in there, there might be like breaths. You know, it might be little clicks. It might be chain swinging. You know, the 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 sound is a little distorted. Um, so it's just a matter of just making pleasing harmonic distortion to satisfy their appetite for the aggression that they want in the record. You know what I'm saying? So how does it feel to you? Um, and then you know the approach on how to do that. That's why it goes back to the second rule: keep it simple, but have a technical sound mind about it. And to be able to do that, number one. Get your acoustic treatment together. Fantastic. So those three. Well, it was amazing talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming yeah. to the podcast. And uh, if you want, if you've got any social media links you want to, um, you know, say on here now, and your Instagram and everything, then feel free to. Right. Um, my Instagram and Twitter and Facebook is Turn Me Up Bow T U R N M E U P B A O. Long. Um, so you find me on there. I'm mostly on my Instagram most times. Um, I have a, uh, school that I'm trying to figure out, you know, um, with courses and stuff to try to talk about these types of things to address the issues of like people that are starting to get into engineering. And I want to focus on fundamentals of, you know, recording studio setup, stuff like that. It's re Academy, um, R E A C A D E M I M Y. And sometimes it's like an underscore at the end on my Instagram, but it's re Academy online on YouTube as well. So that's it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on. See you yeah. soon. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate you uh, inviting me on. I definitely enjoyed this, man. <laughs>